And the third presenter is Jonathan Goodhand, a professor in development and conflict studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, at the University of London. Okay, good, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> and uh, thank you, it's an honor to be here. Um, and I've really enjoyed the, the, the today's sessions. I've, I've, found, I've learned a lot from it. Uh, I'm a bit jet lagged, but I'll do my best. Um, and I can bargain for 20 minutes, so, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> 15 minutes. Okay, I'm going to talk about... Okay, okay, well, I'll, I'll just start. I mean, I'm, my, the, the title of my talk is based on a paper called Hearts and Minds, um, Reconstruction, Governance and Counterinsurgency in Afghanistan. So I'm really trying to zoom in on one particular case. And I'm focusing on governance because... In many ways, you can see governance as at the heart of the, uh, the Afghan wars and attempts to build peace. And the wars and this notion of war to peace transition that is, really isn't one um, can be argued about competing notions of justice and on the role of the state and of local autonomy and then resource distribution. Um, the the so-called uh, counterinsurgency uh, um, expert, David Kilcullen, described the Taliban as an armed rule of law movement. And um, American anthropologist Thomas Barfield argues that international strategy in Afghanistan should move from a government-centric to a, a governance-centric approach. Um, the Taliban aims to make large swathes of the country ungovernable. And the state is being cajoled, persuaded, funded to, to extend its presence into these areas and provide um, um, public goods such as security and, and good governance. And it's assumed in a lot of the debates that there's somehow some kind of virtuous circle which links governance, it's the heart of a virtuous circle uh, linking development and state building. And conversely, there's this kind of uh, vicious circle in which bad governance leads, undermines the state, often drawing on, on illicit economies, um, in this case the open economy, um, undermining the legitimacy of the state and so on. So there's the idea that governance is a, a magic ingredient and very different sets of actors in Afghanistan have converged on this. The development donors think that it's, it's something, a vehicle for, for development. Those involved in state building, peace building thinks it's essential to legi uh, le legitimize the post-war the post order. And the military, the counterinsurgency experts, argue that it's a, an important ingredient to stabilize societies and to counter insurgency, to win hearts and minds. Now, we've talked um, earlier today about evidence and how you draw on evidence. And in the paper, I, I, I look at what the broader debates are about this and what is the link between governance and development, governance and state building, governance and counterinsurgency. Um, I can't go into this in any detail now, but what is clear is that if one looks at kind of empirical and historical processes of development and state building, um, state builders didn't follow the good governance rule book. Good governance doesn't e explain um, and describe governance arrangements in developing countries. It doesn't explain the success stories. You know, the, the late developers didn't develop through um, following good governance um, and processes and, 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 and so on. And they certainly didn't develop through this kind of predominant idea of market enhancing governance. The idea that there should be a, a state which primary, its primary role is um, related to enforcing property rights um, around uh, provide, um, limiting rent seeking and corruption and achieving political accountability. Um, and if one looks at very recent examples of, of, of state building um, as well, one, one, can, one can see that, um, that actually the processes of uh, political consolidation are often shaped by coalitions based on patrimonialism rather than um, this kind of this virtuous circle that's been mentioned. Let's go on to Afghanistan and I want to talk a little bit about um, the process of state building um, and the post-2001 uh, political dispensation. 
Now, the first thing to say is this has not been a water peace transition. Um, it, it's been what is seen as the, a new phase of an extended, an extended conflict. Um, the Bonn Agreement wasn't what Jim, Jim would write about as a, an inclusive grand bargain for peace. It was an exclusive elite pact, which incorporated those on the right side of the war on terror. It sidelined the interests of the Taliban, of, the, uh, um, of, of, of Pakistan. It didn't address underlying power uncertainties. And Lakhdar Brahimi, the, uh, who, who mediates the Bonn Agreement, <coughs> invoked local ownership, a light footprint. And in many ways, this enabled, was kind of facilitated the incorporation of, of strongmen. So there's this long, this kind of continuity between the war years and this latest phase. Um, there was a nexus between foreign money and Afghan politics. And if you see on the right of Karzai, you can see Dostum and Marshal Fahim, two of the main kind of strongmen who emerged in the wartime part of the Northern Alliance. They were brought in to the, in, into, into the, into the state. Um, and the state became the main arena of accumulation. There was this nexus between foreign, foreign money, foreign money and, uh, and Afghan politics. Now, in the early years, some, there were some kind of technocrats and reformers who did play an important role. Ashraf Ghani, who I'll come back to in a minute, who ex-World Bank official, who became the Minister of Interior, sorry, Minister, uh, Minister of Finance, and uh, Hanif Atmar, who, uh, the next NGO worker who became the Minister for Rehabilitation and Rural Development. And they helped bring about some of the main kind of national flagship pro projects in Afghanistan, the National Solid Solidarity Program. Um, the, there were a number of successes just in terms of things like mortality rates, healthcare, education, literacy. I mean, they were tangible improvements during this time. But reforms also had uneven and unexpected effects. In many ways, um, capacities were imported through foreign consultants, bringing in emigre Afghans rather than built um, domestically. And it also set up a lot of tensions within the Afghan state, within the Afghan government, between the, the reforming ministries and the so-called laggards, who were dominated by jihadi networks. Um, and so there was competition for power and for resources um, across the Afghan government. But as time went on, increasingly the technocrats became marginalized and exposing the limitations of a very formalized, centralized state building process. And there are kind of a number of kind of uh, illustrations of this. The Af Afghan constitution is one of the most centralized constitutions in the world in terms of the, the power of the executive presidency. Um, and yet, de facto politics in Afghanistan are highly decentralized decentralized, highly fragmented. Um, there are also contradictions in the international strategy. While there are attempts to create these formal central state institutions, the CIA was still providing large amounts of funding to regional power, um, um, power holders in, in the provinces. Similarly, aid organizations, many of them were funding off budget, rather than what Jim was talking about earlier, rather than through the state, um, there are all these parallel programs um, going out, be out uh, circumventing the state itself. And finally, elections had these very paradoxical effects. Um, elections were seen as these kind of key source of legitimization. Um, and yet, there's some, uh, um, some very interesting work done about the underlying kind of networks that remained the crucial kind of um, sources of power and leverage um, and resources which underpinned the Afghan state. So there was what I, um, Bayat would talk about as a rhizome state. There were these formal structures and institutions, but underneath were the underlying networks. So Karzai in 2004 um, was faced with the, 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 the kind of the dilemma of trying to win re-election. How, how does he win re-election? Does he get mobilized support of technocrats or does he go to the jihadi networks who can deliver votes, the vote banks in the provinces. It obviously goes to, to the vote banks, to the, 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 the patronage networks, 
who essentially delivered his win in the presidential elections. And so from the first set of elections, there was a return and a re-strengthening of jihadi and uh, uh, near patrimonial networks um, in the Afghan state. So the, the result has been a rentier state, one that's dependent on external resources, um, one that is underpinned by informal power structures, and a kind of hybrid structure which is neither institutionalized and, but neither a consolidated form of clientelism. So by the, by the, um, the middle, mid 2000s, there was a serious kind of uh, questioning about the, the approach that be, was being followed by the international community. Um, and there was a kind of a fundamental shifting of how the problem was conceptualized. Um, in 2001, 2002, the problem of insecurity was seen to lie in the absence of a strong, legitimate central state. By 2005, 2006, the central state was seen as part of the problem, a corrupt, illegitimate state which was being outgoverned in the, in the provinces by the Taliban. And there was a shift toward more, more kind of bottom-up local and so-called hybrid forms of governance and support. And here's where there was a kind of an overlapping be overlap between state builders and the, the military and the counterinsurgency gurus, um, particularly as Petraeus came on board. And so coin doctrine um, shifted towards engaging more with the local terrain, trying to understand and to engage with and support the local terrain. terrain. Um, Derek Gregory, um, a very um, good geographer, talks about this as a rush to the intimate and an attempt to work with tribal structures, to fund them, to, to revive old policing structures, to support militias. Um, at its worst, this was a form of crass military orientalism, trying to recreate traditions that never actually existed. And obviously, US Special Forces, Provincial Reconstruction Team advisors, aid donors, were sucked into games they could scarcely understand, and their funding was converted into the currency of, of, of patronage. So the kind of political economy that we're now faced with in, in Afghanistan um, is in very, what the story here is very much a, a one of continuities. You know, a, the war economy that urged in, emerged in the 1980s and 1990s has been reinvigorated in the 2000s. Um, it's already mentioned that there has been, in many ways, um, some economic success in Afghanistan. Growth rates of between 9 to 12 percent. But the very much, it's a very brittle and very narrow based form of growth. And the main kind of aid flows, the main resources, are coming from the um, military, military contracts through aid um, and through the open economy. And um, as David Keane writes about it, so war being less a competition than more a kind of system by which different groups can accrue profits and predation in order, and maintain a kind of a durable disorder, one can see this kind of as a kind of a, a no war, no peace system that has emerged in Afghanistan. The Kabul Bank scandal is one illustration of this, of the level of how embedded corruption is. But also the ambiguous role of corruption. The Kabul Bank scandal actually pulls together northerners, the Marshal Fahim and southern Pashtuns through Karzai, and provides a kind of glue that holds together what is really a very unstable kind of uh, and fragile alliance. Douglas North would call this a, a fragile limited access order. What does he mean by this? Well, it means that uh, an emergent coalition of, of the wielders of violence develops. And they have an interest in limiting access to resources. They carve up the economy in order to limit access and accrue rents. And this gives them an interest in maintaining that system of durable disorder. It's fragile. It can break. It can change if prices change, if the... the if flows of inter international actors change or if um, neighboring countries' policies change. And also actors in this coalition cannot credibly commit. The time horizons are very short. And it means all politics is real politics. You know, it's about life and death. Um, and 
Also, the, the one underlying problem with this limited access order, it doesn't incorporate all the key wielders of violence. So the Taliban um, are outside of this coalition. And regional strongmen are constantly oscillating backwards and forwards into the coalition and out of it again. They're constantly hedging, playing their bets. Um, and yet, there is a, a kind of a, a, a paradox in the sense that I have highlighted all the, some of the pathologies this political economy has created through foreign, foreign intervention. And yet the paradox is this. Although it's created the paradoxes, it's created this fragile limited access order, a sudden ending of funding, which is now certainly threatened, would lead to a return to spoils politics of the 1990s. So it's created pathologies, but a sudden cutoff of funding would actually be even more harmful. What kind of, um, and I've got one, one minute left. Um, what are, how do you kind of make sense of this? What kind of lessons um, do you take from this? And I mean, clearly there are problems about uh, count evidence and counterfactual histories, but I think there are three different kind of narratives now. One is the imperial argument, and it was never about good governance. Good government, you know. We can't take liberal peace builders at face value. Um, you know, we understand good governance as an ideology of north-south relations. It's not actually doesn't help us describe or understand natural behaviour. Second kind of narrative is that about the lost opportunities. That there was a window of opportunity in the early years, um, but liberal peace building wasn't liberal enough. It wasn't muscular enough. There wasn't enough resources invested in it. It wasn't integrated enough. There was a need to do more with more. And yet, we know from the surge that the surge actually amplified rather than resolved problems. So this is a, a clearly a problematic assumption. And then there's a final kind of um, uh, narrative, which Astri Sirk, who's written, wrote a very good book um, called Doing More With Less, argues that you know, it's the path dependency argument. It was, it was doomed to failure from the beginning. Exogenous state building doesn't work. It creates all of these pathologies, these reactions. Um, and it, can, um, it, it, it was doomed to failure. Does, it mean, does that mean international actors don't ever have a role? Um, no. What she argues is that certain preconditions need to be in place. There needs to be an inclusive enough political settlement. There needs to be a sufficiently coherent national domestic elite. There needs to be a sufficiently um, supportive regional environment and so on. But international actors' role is on the margins, certainly not at the centre. And it comes back to the point about, you know, it's the politics, stupid. In Afghanistan, the highly militarised intervention and also the highly economised intervention um, left this massive hole in terms of the politics and around the nature of the political settlement. And I've better finish there.